Today on the bench I have a, an old PlayStation 3 Fat, uh, which has been pretty much abused. Let, let's take a look and see what we can do about it. Hello the internet and welcome to my channel. Today I've got this PlayStation 3 I've got basically for free. It's, to be honest, is to um, experiment with my uh, SMD learning curve, uh, which um, I, have, I have published a video, which I'm going to link here. It doesn't work, even though it was sold as working, but for five pounds it's totally fine. I want to take a look, see if I can make it work before I experiment on it. Uh, something pretty curious about this PlayStation, I don't know exactly what happened, but the seller told me there was some issues with the fan, or I have a feeling maybe the PlayStation was overheating, I'm not sure about that. But basically, that happened. Now, <laughs> for the life of me, I, I can't think of a reason to do this, to be honest. This is the, the fan. Um, so again, this PlayStation is basically junk. I don't care about it. Um, but uh, it doesn't work. I'm curious to see what happened inside, how abused it is inside. Right, first of all, let's try and power it up. Got power supply on, I have a green light here. Let's turn it on. And it immediately switches itself off. I'm wondering what happened here. <laughs> so, oh wow, there is some uh, electrical tape. Probably the cable was damaged. The connector is okay. Yeah, wondering whether the fan is working or not. Let's take a look under the microscope as maybe I found what the problem is. Because obviously there was an issue with the fan on this board. I found this. Oh, look at that. Hello. So I assume that the fan shorted. Probably was disassembled for cleaning. It was closed improperly. The cable shorted. And this happened. Um, oh yeah. Is there a, was there a component in there? Is that a melted component? So it's connecting this side uh, where I see a capacitor. Uh, this end with the capacitor to this fan or the fan. I'm wondering whether that was just a maybe a fuse. Let's check whether there's a short, maybe. Well, it doesn't even beep. Okay. I hate this multimeter, I like my Fluke, but I don't have it handy at the moment. So... Well, obviously there's nothing connected here. Uh, no, it's not that short. And I was checking online for some information and I found someone having exactly the same problem, exactly the same component. Now, apparently there's even a service manual available for the PlayStation 3, which makes sense, it's, it's quite old. And it looks like it's a um, ferrite bead, ferrite bead, yes, uh, more, more or less a fuse, but not exactly a fuse. So um, question is now whether that's the only fault uh, I still don't understand why they they did this to the fan. I'm curious, I'll check online if I can power the f this fan with using my bench power supply to see if it works. Who knows, maybe that's the only problem. And I found a pin out online and uh, obviously this is a PWM fan so I don't, I can't really power it with just uh, 12 volts. It's set to 11 volts uh, but if I give power to the 12 volt rail basically the fan spins for for a second. For a second. There you go. So from my point of view, this works. I mean, unless the PW, PWM circuit is, is not working, this is working and...
And I couldn't resist, it's a bit late here, but I'm just curious to see what happens. Let's, let's take a look. Okay, we've got power. And it's doing exactly the same, so... Let's see if the fan at least start, tries to start this time. Nope. Okay. Well, anyways, it was kind of fun to try and fix the thing. We'll, I'll see what to do with this one, whether I want to continue or just, uh, again, use it for my experiments. So, to be honest, you know, I'd like to check this board with the thermal camera. The only way is to play, uh, run the board briefly, basically without a power supply on top of it. And the only way I could find, I soldered those two cables on the 12 volts directly on the connector. And there's two clips going to the 12 volt input. The five volt is going through the normal cable. I'm measuring the voltage here to see if there's anything at all coming out of the power supply. And it's doing exactly the same, which is, I would say it's good. I'll fire up my thermal camera and see if I can see anything. Oh, I completely forgot. Let's see whether we have any voltage coming out of this thing. No, really. I'm wondering whether either the power supply is faulty or the board is completely shorted somewhere and that's why I don't read any voltage coming out of it. To be on the safe side, I've connected this 8 ohm resistor. It's a 100 watt resistor and 12 volt at 8 ohms is, it should be 18, vo 18 watts. So again, just for a few seconds, that should be perfectly fine. Okay, I don't see any voltage whatsoever coming out of this power supply. Okay, I want to go a step, a step forward to test the power supply. I found a pinout of this power supply on the internet. Uh, it's very easy. There's five volts standby coming out. And when the motherboard senses the, 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 the power switch being touched, it basically returns five volts on a pin, pin one, which is called ACDC standby. So apparently if I short pin five with pin one, the power supply just starts. If it doesn't start, it's the power supply. It's, it's as simple as that. Okay, so as you can see, I've got I've got a little a little jumper between pin one and five, and uh, that should power up the power supply. Well, let's see what happens. Three, two, one, go. It's definitely not doing much. I can hear it clicks. It's doing something, but it is not coming up with anything. And indeed, I found a video online where um, someone is testing this very power supply exactly the same way, without any load, straight into the, the, the sockets here, and you should have 12 volts. So it looks like this is faulty, uh, which is good news. I can get probably another one. I can probably try and fix this one, but again, it's, it's fixing switching mode power supplies. It's not exactly... Uh, for the faint of hearts. Again, I've done it, but uh, not really looking forward to fixing power supplies, to be honest. So, um, maybe I'll just get another one, because uh, it'd be great to have this board running again. And, and a few days have passed, I've got this replacement power supply. It's a used, um, genuine Sony power supply. So, before testing it in the PlayStation, let's test it here. Oh, obviously, I have forced the, uh, the power on through a little jumper here on this connector and I can see whether we have any output at all. So three, two, one, go. And we do have 12 volts. So this is definitely working, which is great news. Let's power it up, let's give it a go and let's see what happens. I'm very curious. I don't know, actually. Oh, something's happening. Ah, oh, still doesn't like it. Boo. Boo. <laughs> What's going on? The fan started full speed and then it stopped like it was overheating. Let's try again. Uh, so it's clear that this board has the yellow light of death because the um, red and green light together through a single diffuser will make a yellow light. And I, I checked it and it's definitely yellow. Now, when it comes to the yellow light of death, like the red ring of death for the Xbox, it's, it could be anything, to be honest. Um, so I had a look online. I don't know much about PlayStation 3, you know, and 
but um, I found quite quite a few interesting information. So solution number one is, uh, as you may imagine, just uh, use a hairdryer, wrap the PlayStation into a towel, warm it up so that apparently hair dryers can cause the solder to melt. Um, uh, good luck with your hair. <laughs> but yeah, let's ignore the, the silly solutions. The most popular solution for the yellow light of death on the PlayStation 3 is um, uh, having a look or replacing these capacitors here. These are the NEC token capacitors. The 0E128 should be the 1200 microfarad, and I think these are 2.5 volts. The thing is, apparently these capacitors can lose capacitance over time, and uh, apparently a vast, the vast majority of the yellow light of death is resolved by replacing one or more of these capacitors. Sometimes, sometimes um, I've read that sometimes just replacing one will restore the required capacitance. Someone also says that when people try and reflow the chip, or maybe just warm up the chip to see whether uh, the, you know, the cracks under the solder balls and everything. That sometimes works, apparently, because by warming up this area, you're all also warming up this area the where the capacitors are. And apparently that's probably enough to restore enough capacitance for the system to work for a while. Anyway, that, that's point number one. Solution number two, again, is reflowing, reballing, and again, there's everything on the internet. Is this necessary? Is it actually working? Is the cracks on the balls, on the solder balls, a thing that you can actually resolve? I don't know, to be honest. It's, it's beyond the purpose of this video. Uh, I may do it at some point if I can fix it just for practicing, um, but um, I actually found a, a much more interesting thing that I'd like to try with this PlayStation. And it's called the Syscon. So this chip here, this one here, no, it's not, sorry. <laughs> this chip here is the, it's the Syscon chip for the PlayStation 3. Apparently this chip is responsible for controlling the fan, controlling the, 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 the buzzer, uh, controlling the, the, the power distribution on the PlayStation itself. So it is this, when you power a PlayStation on, it's this chip which is powering the PlayStation. Long story short, there is a way to access this chip via serial. And by doing that, uh, using a computer, I should be able to see the error log, which is quite interesting. Now, obviously, Sony have never published the error logs for this PlayStation for anything, obviously. Um, so th there, there are some community-made uh, error codes, sorry, error codes lists. And um, some are more useful than others. They may be misleading, whatever. To be honest, it, it sounds like fun. Uh, you know that I don't like, you know, I'm not repairing things because I want, to re I want to make it work, but for the sake of repairing it and learning something in the way. And, and this feels really like a, an interesting small challenge to, to try and access this Syscon. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. In order to access the Syscon chip, I need uh, a serial connection with my laptop, with my computer, uh, which is not the RS-232, which um, if I'm not mistaken, is about 12 volts, is driven by 12 volts pulses. I need a TTL level serial connection and I purchased uh, this adapter here. It's very cheap on, on the internet. And this is giving me a serial connection at TTL level. Now, looking on this page on the PS3 developer wiki, uh, which is, uh, it's, it's incredible, to be honest, I found all the details I need, plus there's plenty of videos and tutorials online on how to connect. But basically, this PlayStation has a CXR713120 dash 202GB. And if you look here on the on the list, there's a CXR713120 202GB. So that's the one I'm looking for. And this chip is installed at the factory on the CECHC PlayStations, which is exactly this one. Now, if I scroll down, uh, this is also known as um, COK002. If I'm scrolling down, uh, you can find that's for the COK002, 
is basically telling you where to attach your, your, your probe. It's basically these three pins here, which are, I think they are at the back of the board uh, behind the, the chip. And, uh, and this is where basically I'm going to connect uh, these little device here. So there will be um, a ground pin here, and then there's receive and transmit. So ground obviously will go to the ground of the PlayStation, then we have receive and transmit. Uh, I also would like to show you there's a picture here, which it's incredible, to be honest. This is, I guess, how someone managed to reverse engineer into the chip and to find what we're going to do today. So <laughs> today, for me, it's an easy thing. You know, I connect to serial and I talk to the thing. Someone at some point has done this thing with a live working PlayStation. It's absolutely, I don't know, I haven't got words to describe this. It's absolutely amazing. So the next step is let's connect these little adapter to the appropriate points, test points on the PlayStation. You don't need to obviously power up the PlayStation fully to access the chip. The chip is powered by the 5 volts. So at this mo the moment you give power to the power supply, the power supply will output 5 volts and the Cisco chip is going to be powered and it should be able to hopefully give us some indication on why this PlayStation is not powering up. Right, so everything is ready. Well, not, not really, I need to power up the PlayStation. Well, at this point, Python, COM3, CXR, enter, okay, authorize. Yes, look at that. It's amazing. <laughs> it's just, uh, I don't know, I was totally not expecting to be able to hack into a PlayStation 3 in 2022 like this. I think we are ready to try and read the, the Cisco error message. Now, before I go ahead, uh, I've been playing with this PlayStation, you know, power, I, I can't remember last time I powered it up, whether I had the power supply fully connected, whatever. So I would say, let's power it up a couple of times. Let's reproduce the error message. So at least when I'm looking into the logs, uh, I know that the last two error messages belong to the actual error message that we're looking for. So yeah, let's power it up and hopefully we'll do exactly what we were doing before and uh, we'll move from there. Let's go back to uh, calling the script. Okay, let's uh, authorize. And we are in. So error log, that's the command I need to input to read the message, get, and 00, zero is going to be the last error message. And there we are. Uh, let's also read number two, which is error log get zero 01. Amazing, is exactly the same. Uh, now let's read number three, get 03, just out of curiosity. No, it's still the same, so happy day. So this is our error message. If I've done my homeworks correctly, the, this is the error code. This is the A080-1200. Now A is always A, uh, for whatever reason. The next number is zero. Uh, unknown, frequent error, whatever, uh, but that's fine. The third number, it's what, well, actually the 80 is what interest, interests us, which is static state, the console completed the post and was in a static state. The error happened when the PlayStation was powered on, which is exactly what happens. That's fine. And then we have the next number is the category or category, which is number one system error and error 200. Now, if I'm looking down here on system error 1200, the error number 1200, it's in here and it says thermal. Oh yeah, that it's very consistent with what's happening. He says the CPU is overheating. This is a common error. The usual culprit is failed thermal interface material, blah, blah, blah. So basically saying, check your thermal pace, check your heat sink. Now the problem is this is shutting down immediately. And I doubt that 
I mean, if, if I was running the PlayStation without heatsink, yes, that would happen. Uh, I know that the, there is thermal paste under the, uh, it's called the heat spreaders, uh, which are the, the, basically the, the lids of the CPU. But that, again, I doubt that even the driest paste that you can have would cause this problem. It would probably power up and shut down in 30 seconds, but not in two seconds. So if I keep reading, obviously it says remove the paste, uh, remove the spreaders and the lead, blah, blah, blah. He says if that still doesn't work, it could be an issue with the temperature monitor chip, IC1101. And I'd like to take a look at that. Beyond that, some users have noticed that dead CPUs can throw error 1200. So we may be out of luck here, because uh, again, uh, either maybe a solder ball under the CPU, which is not passing the, um, the temperature, everything is possible. Or if it's a dead temperature sensor in the CPU, there's nothing we can do. But we can definitely check this monitor chip, check the surrounding, maybe, maybe it's shorted, maybe it's open, maybe it's damaged, maybe it's not there. I don't even know where it is. So great, I mean, uh, this is amazing. <laughs> I got my error messages here. It's fantastic. There is much more you can do apparently, but for now, I think this is what I need to be honest. So a few days have passed. I have tried to educate myself a bit on what's going on here and how the PlayStation works in terms of thermals. Uh, I have posted some help questions on, uh, on a few communities. I found quite a lot of help on PSX Place. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank in particular the user Timbo. Thank you very much Timbo for all your help. I hope I can make this work again with your help. So we know the PlayStation is shutting down because the CPU, which is this one, is overheating. The way the temperature is sensed on the CPU is, is this. Uh, there's a temperature sensor inside the CPU. It's, a, it's called a di diode. I think it's actually a transistor. So it's an analog signal. It's connected to two pads under the CPU. And those two pads are connected to this little guy here. Uh, this is basically an analog to digital uh, converter. So it reads the value from the CPU in an analog way, goes into this chip, and this chip is um, connected by a SN bus, which I understand it's a, it's a IC2 protocol, to the um, syscon. So the syscon talks digitally to this little chip. This chip can sense the CPU temperature, also has an internal temperature sensor. At this point, we have a few scenarios. Scenario number one, the syscon here cannot talk to this little chip here. The chip is defective. And uh, I guess that when you start a PlayStation and Syscon can't see the CPU temperature, the Syscon says, hey, I, I have no idea what the temperature is on the CPU. I'm panicking, I'm shutting down immediately. So that could be just replacing the chip, which is a, it's, it's not a custom Sony chip, so it should be available. Scenario number two could be that there is a break in the line between the CPU and the sensor. And I think when a temperature sensor is um, an open line, usually they, they report the highest possible temperature. So maybe when, uh, when you start the PlayStation, the, the system sees the highest possible temperature and goes into panic mode. And this hopefully, you know, it could be like a broken trace or something. It could also be, unfortunately, the uh, VGA ball under the CPU itself. Now, the next scenario is that the temperature sensor inside the cell itself is faulty, or again, the VGA is disconnected at the bottom. Now, in this case, the temperature sensor is probably reading a uh, stupid temperature, but it would read the stupid temperature all the time, even when the board is idle. So that could definitely be used in troubleshooting. The final scenario is that the, the heat spreader needs new thermal paste. So this little metal square is called, it's the IHS, yeah, I think is the integrated heat spreader. Um, it's basically, um, well, a heat spreader. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, it's glued, unfortunately, on the CPU is quite, uh, it's quite difficult to remove. It's glued with some silicon type compound all around here. The die of the CPU is obviously here in the middle and there's some thermal paste in between the metal and the die itself. Now this machine is, what is it, like 15 years old? So it is very possible, probably actually very likely, that the thermal paste has gone dry. And um, obviously if the thermal paste doesn't work anymore, chances are that when the CPU is powered, he, uh, the temperature just uh, shoots up and that's what's being reported to Syscon and Syscon just shuts it down. Now, I don't believe that that's the case, unfortunately. That would be the easiest of the scenarios, but I don't believe that's our problem. And the reason is that PlayStation shuts down too early. If the PlayStation shut down after, say, 30 seconds, and the fan is going faster and faster and faster and then it shuts down, 
Yes, that could totally be the thermal paste under, under this uh, metal plate, but because it shuts down after literally two seconds, I, I doubt, I think even dry paste will have some kind of thermal uh, conductivity. And I, I, I don't know, I don't think that's the case, but uh, you know me, I like uh, scientific approaches. So I'm going to connect to the Syscon and see what the temperature reported by the CPU is when the board is idle. If the temperature is stupidly high, when the board is idle, then I know that either the sensor is not working or there's a, a break in the trace of the converter here doesn't work. But if the temperature is okay, and then it shoots up as soon as I power up the board, chances are I just need to remove the IHS. Now, to read the temperature sensors of this board through Syscon, I need to go into, I think it's called uh, internal mode. So it's not the, if I now reconnect to Syscon and try to read the temperature, those commands are not available. I need to issue some commands to the Syscon and uh, use this diagnostic cable, which at some point it will need to be grounded so that the Syscon is going into this internal mode. And then I should be able to see real time the temperature of the CPU. So uh, let's reconnect to the board and uh, let's issue those commands. Let's turn the Cisco into internal mode, see what it reads, and then we'll move from there because at that point I should know what's happening to the temperature sensors. So we should be in internal mode right now. And uh, to test this, I can issue a very simple command, which is called bcount. Let's see if it works. It does. Oh, wow. So this police station has been turned on 2006 times, has been shut down 17,067 times, and it's been on 241 days. Uh, so that's been well used, let's <laughs> put that way. So I've, I've now experimented a bit with the behavior of the Syscon and the PlayStation, and I found something interesting. So first of all, the thermal sensors are not available, they're not reporting any temperatures until the PlayStation tries to power up. So that doesn't work with my idea of, you know, let's see what's the temperature reported by the chips when the system is, is idle. It's in standby because it doesn't work like that. So if I try now to uh, issue the power state, I think it is, command, as you can see, uh, both the GPU and the CPU, uh, GPU is uh, the RSX, the CPU is BE, they're both um, labeled as unavailable. If I try to bring up the PlayStation, which is like pushing the on off button, okay? And in, while it's trying to power up, so while it has 12 volts running, issue the power state command again, I should get an, an available state instead. So let's try this. Okay, here in the in between, while the PlayStation is reporting something and is reporting a thermal shutdown, as you can see here, you have the power state command and you see that now it says available. So this is telling me that my sensors are supposed to work. Now, the thing is, if I try and look for temperature zero, which is the cell temperature, when it's in idle, I have zero degrees. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna bring up the PlayStation again and issue the temp zero command while it's booting up. See what we get. So bring up. And here we go, temperature zone, BE primary, temperature 74.31. Now, let me try this again. I'll, I'll explain you in a second why I'm doing this again. So 
So now we are getting 70.56. Now previously it was 74. Now I tried off camera and I could get up to 86 or something, uh, which I guess is probably the, probably the last one before it shuts down. Now this is telling me, I feel, that the sensor is working. If the sensor wasn't working, I would get, I don't know, either zero, or I think the maximum is like, if it's, there's an open line, it's like 127 degrees, I would probably get a fixed 127. What I'm saying is I would get a fixed number. I don't think a temperature sensor fails reporting wrong temperatures, or if it does, it's gonna be like a fixed wrong temperature. And every time I try, I get a different number. And to be honest, not knowing anything about PlayStations, this is telling me the, the circuit is working, the sensor is working, everything is working. It's just the chip is actually getting hot. And as much as I feel it's unlikely, I feel I just need to remove the IHS, the heat spreader, which is not something I'm happy to do because again, it's not easy, unfortunately, on the CPU. On the GPU, it's much easier. But uh, yeah, it, this, this is where my diagnostic is taken to. It's just the CPU is actually getting hot. And I think I may have found a way to, you know, just test the idea that is just the uh, heat spreader to be replaced. Um, so I've removed the fan and um, unfortunately the, the, the CPU is under uh, this part, which cannot be removed. So what I've done, I have some um, canned air, which I can use upside down as a freezer spray. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to cool down the CPU areas. If the problem is the actual heat sink, uh, the, 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 how can I say, the heat not being dissipated by the heat sink, the CPU should be able to power up a bit more. So rather than shutting down after two seconds, it will shut down after, I don't know, I don't know, five, 10 seconds, whatever. Okay, and now I try and power up and see if it, if it does the same or it let me uh, run for a few more seconds. So I'm about to hit bring up on my laptop. So three, two, one, go. Yes. You may have noticed that the fan spun for several seconds, then he bipped once. I guess it's like, hey, I'm about to overheat. And uh, and then the fan eventually spun up faster and it shut down. So yeah, that's definitely, from my point of view, is definitely the confirmation that nothing is the faulty here. It's just the CPU is actually overheating. Okay, it's time to remove the lid or delete the, the CPU, which is this one. Now, as I said, unfortunately, the CPU is attached to the to the PCB um, underneath by uh, a bead of some silicone style compound, which goes all around the lid, like here. The, there should be a little gap in this position here. And there are many tutorials online using various tools. Uh, the problem with that is the PCB or the, CP, or the CPU, which is this green part under the lid, has actually traces on it. Even if I wanted to use some sharp tool as I've seen in, in very good tutorials, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. The risk of damaging those traces is extremely high. So, you know, if I had a chance to experiment on a scrap board, something which is beyond repair, uh, why not? Um, it's definitely probably a faster way um, to do using, using a tool. Instead, I'm going to try and use this, which is floss line. Now, the idea is that you run the, the floss slowly, but surely all around the, the edges and eventually cut through this, this compound. Now, I've created this little like holding board and the purpose of this holding board is to keep the PlayStation from moving. Uh, I will clamping to the desk because the idea is when I uh, I run the line like this and I push like for example this direction the board will slide as well and so I don't have anybody here to hold the board so I designed this and it seems to be working pretty well. Let's give it a go. I will also use my hot air station. I will uh, set it on a, on an arm and keep it here like I don't know 100 degrees something to try and soften up that compound a little bit. Uh, it looks very tough, to be honest. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna take quite a lot of floss line, I guess, but hopefully I can make this work. So let's get started. Cutting the sealant with the floss line was extremely slow, tedious, and painful, uh, I've almost got my fingers bleeding. I used a ton of floss line, but as an upside, now my workshop smells like a dentist surgery. 
wait, wait a minute, is that an upside? The line kept breaking very easily, so eventually I tried different brands and also tried using two and three lines bundled together to try and speed up things. Uh, that may have been a mistake and you'll see in a minute why. Towards the end, I felt brave enough to use a very thin and flexible razor blade and honestly, I feel I should have used that from the beginning as maybe thanks to the grooves already dug by the floss line, it went in very easily. Well, eventually though, I managed to cut through the sealant and the IHS was removed. No. Ah, oh, really. So, bad news. Um, I went for the floss line method because uh, I was led to believe it was the safest possible way, even though it would take time, blah, blah, blah. It is not. I repeat, it is not. So let me, let me show you what I mean. So here on top right, you can see there's, uh, well, I basically polished off the, the solder mask. It's not a big deal. I don't see damage to traces and, uh, and all seems to be good here. And if I continue into the left hand side, uh, it looks like it's the same thing, to be honest. I don't see damage to traces. It's the only polished off, which is, yeah, not a big deal. Here, bottom left, this looks like it's the same thing. But unfortunately, bottom right, there you go. It's incredibly, incredibly frustrating. I was hoping to fix this thing and, and look, look at what I've done. <sighs> Don't know what to say. It's, it's not nice when these things happen. And no, I tried with the very, very fine line uh, wire. It's a 0.14 millimeter wire. It's too big. <laughs> and again, if it was one trace, why not? You know, I can spend some time on it. But all those traces, uh, no. Uh, it, it's incredibly frustrating. Well, that, that's why you learn, right? That's why you, you try, you fail, you learn. And you know, you know, next time I'm not going to use the line, I'm going to use this, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's just a shame because uh, I felt I was very close to have a working PlayStation. And by the way, again, this is kind of a, an important PlayStation. It's the one with the PlayStation 2 compatibility. So I'm really sorry. Again, I, I'm just, I feel like I, I failed myself, obviously, when these things happen. Again, also, I, I said, it's a shame because I, I fixed the power supply, I fixed the fan, and it was just a matter of deleting the thing and just re replace the thermal paste. I'm sure that some of you can understand how I feel right now. <laughs> Anyways, that's the end of the video. <laughs> I, I was totally not expecting to end this video here, right now, this way, but unfortunately there's nothing, really nothing I can do on this PlayStation anymore, um, besides replacing the CPU, of course. So lesson learned, uh, let's move on. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed and you hopefully learned something from my failures as well. Hope to see you soon, you have a great day and thanks for watching.